Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi. We, we have yeah. 60 people watching. 60 you. people on the Zoom. Yes. And, and Boaz is back. Okay, Boaz. It's oh, all yeah. your platform. Uh, this is only in, on the Zoom. Basically, we send everybody another link to watch, which is not an interactive link. It's only we chat, and I'll pass on the uh, re request, question, whatever people will ask uh, in the other broadcast. Okay, go ahead, Tal. Tal is muted. I'm mute now. Okay, can you hear me now, everyone? You can. Yes. All right, hello, hello from New York City. Welcome, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, final session of the day. You're watching or you're rather listening, I should say, to uh, the, the, the seventh Freedom Convention of Israel's Freedom Movement. We have many people tuning in from Israel today. Keep it in mind, uh, dear speakers, and also from the United States. So just know that we will talk about how both countries are dealing with a pandemic. And uh, in this next conversation, we will break down different aspects of the corona crisis worldwide and its political and economic implications. We will compare between strategies to fight the pandemic and also stabilize the economy. And we will explore why is economic freedom important in dealing with coronavirus as we compare also between uh, different health systems around the world. And we have the best panels to do so. We decided to divide our panel uh, to two different sessions. My name is Tal Heinrich. I'm an Israeli journalist uh, located in New York City, the epicenter of the coronavirus uh, right now around the world. And I'm joined by our very dignified guests. Uh, we will start this first hour with Dr. Yaron Brook. He's the host of the Yaron Brook Show podcast and the chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute. We're also joined by Fleming Rose, a Danish journalist. I think you should uh, mute yourself, guys. All right. And uh, Fleming Rose, he's a Danish journalist and senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Now, the second hour, uh, we will be joined by Jonathan Honig. I just want to preview this right now. He's an investor and founder of the Capitalistic Hedge Fund and a contributor for Fox Business. Tom Palmer will be joining us uh, as well. He's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and vice president for international programs at the Atlas Network. Now, as Boaz mentioned before, and I would like to mention it uh, again, uh, we encourage your engagement. Uh, and so before we begin, uh, you, can submit, you, you can submit your questions. I just want to mention this during the discussion. Uh, Boaz will send me uh, via WhatsApp your, your questions, and we will try to address them as we go. You can send them in, in Hebrew or rather in English, that's preferred. So uh, great to have you here, everyone. Uh, Yaron is the most veteran participant, I think, uh, of this conference among our panelists. Uh, I think we will start with you. We'll kick it off with you. Are you calling me old? Is that what no, you mean? No, no, no. <laughs> Just in, in our conference, I mean. Um, I, I think it's the seventh uh, freedom movement, uh, freedom convention, uh, uh, and and you've been there from the very beginning, right? I think I've done three or Maybe four. This. I can't remember, so I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I was there at the first one, but I've been here. I've yeah. been to several of them. So, so you know, we're all stuck in our homes, and we feel the crisis every day, every hour. Tell us, what is your assessment of how bad things are for the U.S. And, and for Israel? You know, we know in what shape we entered this crisis, but the question is, in what shape are we going to get out of it? And I'm asking because I saw someone uh, on your podcast last week. They asked you if the U.S. is going to come out of it being Venezuela. <laughs> So no, I don't think we're going to come out of it being Venezuela. It takes it takes decades of of corrupt and socialist and uh, really horrific status policies to get to the condition of Venezuela. But look, part of the great tragedy of what we're experiencing right now and part of the great fail, which is government policy all over the world, is that we don't have a good assessment of how we're doing right now. That is, the data is not available. There is a real shortage of data because of shortage of testing, because the fact that we're not getting, you know, the kind of sophisticated data we should be getting at this point. And uh, the, the massive fail in the United States to test, test, test. The, the U.S. 
for months, sat on its hands and did nothing. Uh, bureaucratic red tape restricted the ability of private companies, private laboratories, even university laboratories and hospital laboratories to actually engage in testing. We should be today in a position where millions of people are being tested and we have a clear picture of how many people are infected, how many are not, how many people are in ICU, how many people do we expect to go to ICU? We don't know. I mean, everybody's talking about this peak demand at hospitals. Nobody has a clear idea. We've got models, but the models are not based on real data. And they should be. There's no excuse for, for this failure. So it's hard to tell. You know, we've, as you know, in New York, is hit hard. But hit hard means that the, you know, 1,300, 1,400 deaths, we don't know how many people are infected. We, we know how many people have tested positive, but we have no clue how many people have been infected because most people have not been tested. So we don't really know if 1,300 is a lot or a little, uh, you know, if the death rate is high or if the death rate is low. We are flying blind here when there's no excuse to be flying blind. In terms of economics, there's no question we're taking a massive hit in the United States and I think in much of the Western world. The fact that uh, our politicians have basically shut down our economies um, is, is unbelievably painful and unbelievably painful mostly for small business owners, for uh, people who work for small businesses or people who work generally, you know, the working class. Uh, it is particularly harmful to people who don't have a lot of savings in the bank. So there is real pain out there. That doesn't turn the United States into Venezuela. It doesn't turn the United States into a poor country. Yeah, we're still a very, very wealthy country. We still have immense productive capacity. We still have, relatively speaking, flexible markets. We don't have, unfortunately, free markets. We don't have capitalism. We, we, whatever we come out of this, we're going to come out of this weaker than we were. We're going to come out of this struggling. We're going to come out of this poorer, not poor, but poorer. And it's going to be slow. It, this is not going to be a V-shaped recovery. This is going to be a slow recovery to a large extent because of the way governments are responding. And because we live in a very mixed economy where so much of our economy is, uh, is command controlled by government or regulated by government in ways that restrict our ability to jumpstart it fast as we come out of this. So, I mean, let's bring in you, the, uh, let's bring you in this conversation. Um, President Trump, he said that he won't allow the cure to be worse than the disease. Now, the biggest challenge for policymakers these days is to try to strike this balance between addressing the spread of the pandemic and, of course, uh, the number of, of, of deaths, and also while trying to guarantee the well-being and, and the welfare of the public. All that, as Iran mentioned, while trying to shape policy decisions around uh, models based on incomplete or even biased data, if, if we look to China, uh, so given what we know and what we have, let's, let me ask you this. What should be the objective of the administration? What are the priorities in this fight the way you see it? Just a few caveats. I'm sitting in Copenhagen and not in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, and therefore, I would be hesitant to, um, to appear as an expert on what is going on in the U.S. at the moment. But we have a very interesting situation here in Scandinavia, where you have Denmark, where I'm now. Uh, our social democratic government has uh, enforced rather strict measures. They have closed schools, closed restaurants and cafes, and uh, most people are working from home. And then a few kilometers from where I sit, we have Sweden, which uh, have a very different approach. They have not closed schools. They have kept uh, businesses uh, open. Um, right now, it seems as if the death rate in Sweden is accelerating compared to Denmark, but it's still within statistical uncertainty. And I agree completely with Yaron that, that, that the policies that governments are enforcing now are being done without any reliable data. So we really don't know. I mean, if it turns out that Sweden will not suffer more in terms of, 
of, of uh, people infected uh, and uh, fertility rates, then um, the US approach and the Danish approach will turn out to be a really disaster because the price we are paying is very, very high. Do you think that Sweden will eventually maybe change course like we've seen in, in, in the case of the United Kingdom because of maybe public pressure, because of world pressure? I mean, they have already corrected their cause. For instance, they had a limit of 500 people gathering in public. They have reduced that to 50 people. But in Denmark, it's two people. <laughs> uh, two <laughs> people. So, yeah. so, so they are still ahead of the... Uh, of, of, of the pack in, 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 in that sense. But of course, there is a lot of pressure. But, but the interesting thing about Sweden is that the politicians have left it to uh, the health professionals to make decisions, although there are disagreements and discussions within the health professional co uh, community. In Denmark, it's, it's more the politicians and the government uh, who is speaking on this in public and communicating uh, key decisions. Um, but my bigger concern, I mean, I'm, I'm not an economist like uh, Yaron, but I am concerned mm -hmm. about civil liberties. And um, um, I mean, across the board, our privacy uh, is being compromised, our freedom of assembly and um, um, our freedom of movement have been curtailed and and of course there are good reasons uh, there are at least some reasons for this we still know don't know how how good they are but uh, but but obviously uh, people are being infected and there are people who are dying from this uh, uh, disease but 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 I'm concerned with the speed and and the amount of emergency uh, legislation that is being passed, not only in authoritarian regimes, but also in, uh, in, in liberal democracies. And we should not forget that it's only 20 years ago we had 9-11 and we had a lot of uh, laws passed in the aftermath of the terrorist attack on, on the US, uh, the Patriot Act, uh, also uh, limitations on, on, on civil liberties. And usually it turns out that governments tend to overreact and they have to, you know, roll back. Uh, and it turns out that, that, you know, you know this saying from Benjamin Franklin that if you are willing to sacrifice your uh, liberty for security, then you don't deserve either security uh, nor freedom. But we know for a fact that when you limit civil liberties in the name of security, you know that you are getting less freedom, but you are never sure that you will get more uh, security. And that's the kind of situation we are in now, I think. Tal, can, I comment, can I comment? Yeah, yeah that? jump in. Yeah, first, it's, it's great to be on a panel with Fleming. It's always a pleasure. Um, I, I agree completely with Fleming. I mean, the, the, the scary part of this is that government, whether in the economic realm or the civil liberty realm, is taking on massive powers, powers that, you know, we really haven't had short of like World War II in the United States. And it, the government is on a war footing without Congress really debating this and declaring a state of emergency, without any kind of checks and balances. There's no mechanism for checks and balances that, you know, governors declare emergency. They, they you know, they, they shut down whole states and there's no way for anybody to object to say, wait a minute, maybe we're overreacting. Maybe there's too much here. The same with civil liberties. And the scary thing about all of this <clears throat> is that we know that one government, once government takes these measures, they almost never roll them completely back. They give you back some of it. They make you feel a little freer after the emergency has passed. But they never take it all back. And, and as Fleming mentioned, the Patriot Act, the Patriot Act is still strong and going. If anything, it keeps getting reinforced. We have in the United States still FISA courts, which are secret courts with, with no, uh, you know, with, with no questioning, with no ability to really uh, check up on them. It is, and the more the government uses emergency powers, the more the government takes control, the less freedom we're going to have on the other side of this. And, and you could argue, okay, it's an emergency. They have to do something. I think they're, I think they're way overreacting, but they have to do something. But every provision of emergency regulation should have a sunset. 
should have a hard end, should have criteria by which we come out of it, should have a plan. One of the shocking things about all this is not only are they doing it without data, there's no plan. There's no exit strategy. There's no, what is victory, right? What, what, what does it mean to defeat this virus? What happens in the fall? What happens in the summer? They're winging it. Everybody is shooting from the hip, winging it, and you get a sense of unthinking, right? The, the opposite of a scientific approach. This is an approach of, based on emotion and based on power politics more than anything else. I want to ask you, uh, is... Wait, you're on just here. Is fighting the coronavirus just like fighting a foreign enemy, let's say? I mean, do you think it was wise uh, to enact the Defense Production Act, the, the, the DPA, General Motors now, or in order to make ventilators, for example? So what should be the threshold to uh, enacting this mechanism in your view? So I, I don't know if you, I don't know who you are asking, but in my view, they shouldn't be enacting this mechanism ever. I don't think the mechanism should exist. Mm -hmm. I think the law should be taken off the books. All the government needs to do, let's say they need ventilators. All, All the right. government needs to do is take the market price of ventilators, add a 20% premium off of it, and tell the world, we are willing to buy 760,000 ventilators, which is supposedly the deficit in the United States, at market plus 20. I mean, everybody will try to build ventilators to appeal to this demand instead of fighting the market, instead of trying to coerce the market, instead of the government telling GM, you have to do this and this is how to do it. Use the market, provide the right incentives to the market to create the products that you need. Go into the marketplace and say, we'll buy as many masks as you can produce or we'll buy a billion masks at this price. And producers will go out there and try to build this, make as many masks as possible. People will change their production lines to do this in order to make a profit. Use the profit motive. Use the, the marketplace in order to drive the production of things that are really necessary. And so, no, I don't think the government should view this as a war. It is not a war. Uh, I don't think the government should be enacting these special powers to force. I don't think they should do it during a war either, by the way but I certainly don't think they should be doing it now. Use market incentives to create the products that we need. It's, it's relatively simple to do. Uh, Fleming, give Can us I a have... sense of, of how is it being done in, in, in your area, in Denmark right now? Uh, well, there are some differences in, in, in Europe. Uh, the Netherlands and Sweden seem to be the outliers. Uh, Denmark is somewhere in the middle, but uh, in, in, uh, in France you have curfew uh in spain the army has been sent into the streets to uh to control that people are not um, uh, um, breaking uh, the new established uh, rules but 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 come back to come back to 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 what yaron initiated i think unfortunately that uh, yaron and i and and the other on the panel here we are in a minority today uh, and because why can the government get a, get away with things like that? Because if you can frame this question as an issue of life and death, or security or freedom, then unfortunately the the, that the vast majority of, of people will will prioritize uh, uh, security and they are willing to sacrifice uh, uh, freedom. And I think that is what is going on. Uh, around the world and the government if they are able to f to to frame it like they did after 9-11 with these surveillance uh, uh, initiatives uh, in initiatives if you can if, if you can reduce it you know why are you talking about privacy this is a matter of life and death what do you prefer you know to live with the risk or uh, or, or have this surveillance uh, uh, unfortunately the vast majority of people are willing to uh, to live with less freedom uh, as soon as uh, the government promised them more security. But I think we should be, you know, very vigilant uh, when, when the government uh, use this kind of language and, and any government that, play, that plays on people's fears, uh, we should be really, really careful to, um, not, to, not to accept what, uh, what, 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 what they are saying. And, and this boils down to, I think, something about human nature, that we are, you know, we are not born liberal Democrats. We are maybe in favor of our own freedom, but we are not that willing to accept 
the freedom of others uh, as soon as they use that freedom in a way that we don't like. Um, and, and that's why every society and, and every community has to, to, to re-educate themselves in exercising these fundamental um, uh, values like uh, freedom of expression, uh, tolerance, uh, and, and things like that. It doesn't come as, you know, a fact of nature. Mm -hmm. Iran, many countries are looking to the United States to see how the leaders of, of the free world are, are handling this crisis. Uh, many headlines these days are reading that President Trump and the White House have lost much valuable, uh, valuable time uh, a six-week period prior to the outbreak and, and have not taken it, seri taken it seriously enough and prepared ahead of time, whether with masks, PPEs, uh, uh, ventilators. Uh, how much, Iran, of, of what we're seeing now should be blamed, do you think, on the federal government? I mean, talk to us a bit about federal versus local responsibility. Oops, you, you froze there, Tal. I froze. Um, oh, yeah, I'll answer the question. Mm -hmm. Is everybody frozen? Uh, no, we can I, I hear, hear you. you. We can hear. Is yes. Iran with us? I'm not sure. Fleming, I can see you. I can't see Iran. Yes, I, I can hear you, Otal. <laughs> All right. So let, let's go back. Um, uh, I don't know if you can ask this, if I can ask you the same question because mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm not sure about, you know, here mm -hmm. it's, it's a federal system versus local responsibilities. So there is a lot. On, on, on the federal government and also a lot on, on the governors and, and every state around the U.S. has its own policy. Mm -hmm. um, I think Iran is maybe going to... I'm back. back, sorry. Okay. Look, Zoom dropped me for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so talk to us about this balance between sure. federal responsibilities and local responsibilities in the U.S. Because I, I think... What's going on. But we can hear you. Let's try again, or I can continue with the uh, Fleming just for 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 mm. the time being until Iran sorts out the issue. Um, Fleming, how long do you think can this current situation continue? By the way, with the full shutdown, Iran, are you back? I I think I am. I think you are. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I'm not sure. But I can hear you, right? Yeah, I can. I can hear you, but yes. your voice is muddled somehow. But um, for how long can this go on? Uh, yeah, what do you think? Uh, I mean, I mean, it, 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 yeah. I mean, it depends on the pain you are willing to uh, willing to live with. Um, you know, people have been living in in, in times of long wars uh, with deprivation and. Uh, and all kinds of uh, very unpleasant things, but it's clear that 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 this is a disaster for the economy, and it will take a, take a long time to get back to normalcy. Uh, and and the more this goes on, and I think that's why you can sense a certain you know sense of desperation on behalf of uh, of, of governments around the world. And you have to strike this balance between you know getting the economy going because a, a disastrous economy will, will also cost lives. I mean, people losing jobs, uh, families falling apart, uh, uh, all these kind of things. And then uh, being responsible when it comes to physical distancing and, and, and uh, the ne necessity of uh, reining in the, uh, the virus. Uh, it's a balance that uh, every government has to to battle with, and and I'm pretty sure that not all, not all governments will strike this, the the right balance, and there are governments who will fall uh, because of this, and and that's also one of the reasons why I think, you know, most governments will do what they have the power to do, and that is basically uh, limiting. Uh, uh, um, uh, the freedoms of its uh, citizens. So a couple of questions to you here. Since you are in Denmark and you're an expert on, on you know, what's happening in Norway and Sweden also right now, and uh, you, also you, hear me. you can't hear me? You, you, you scrambled. Tal, it sounds... 
טל, it sounds like uh, your voice is, uh, is, is modeled, yes. And, uh, and uh, it looks like uh, we lost uh, your own on the process. So should we, uh, should we reconnect? Should we Tal, reconnect Tal, Tal, maybe got, get out and get back in and hopefully you will be refreshed and uh, we can continue. Uh, and uh, I'm now learning that Yaron is coming back and uh, Yaron, if you are with us, take the lead till Tal will come back. Okay. Oh, <laughs> okay, wrong. Uh, it was uh, fake news. Yaron is not with us yet. Uh, so, uh, uh, Fleming, Mm -hmm. You are the lone rage, ranger <laughs> now. <laughs> But I can, I can, you, you know, Tom, Tom Palmer is also uh, okay. here. So maybe okay. Tom can join the conversation. Yeah, let's, let's mix it. You know, we are uh, basically broadcasting from Israel and uh, uh, we know, we know to be improvisers. So let's bring Tom Palmer into the conversation. Tom, are you with us? Wait a second. Let me Yes. Yes. Hello to you, Ming and Boaz and Corinne and all my friends. Hello, Tom. Hello, Tom. Good to see you. Good to see you. Shalom. Shalom indeed. And uh, Tom, can, can you give us your take on the situation? And Tal, we just came back to us and I'm... We are mixing the session and bringing Now all I'm the unmuted. friends we can. Okay. So, so go okay, ahead. Okay, let me just uh, uh, introduce Tom. Just uh, again, Tom Palmer is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and vice, vice president for international programs at the Atlas Network. Uh, Tom, gr great to have you. I know you were listening in throughout the, the, the session. So first, your just initial thoughts about what you heard so far. Well, I think it's very important for us to remember that uh, important principles that have been proven over millennia are not suddenly dissipated or disproven by one crisis. Sometimes extraordinary times do require extraordinary measures. And when we return to normal times, we need to demand the normal rules, which include the things that Fleming talked about, freedom of association, freedom of travel, and so on. I do worry that advocates of liberty can be marginalized from the conversation if they don't acknowledge that these are extraordinary times, which the various participants have done. Some kooks on the very margins have denied that, and I think that they discredit the cause of liberty in doing so. But we need to be absolutely <coughs> vigilant because we know how states, how politicians, how governments, how holders of power are. When they get a power, they don't want to give it up. And we have to be completely adamant at the same time that we need to publicly acknowledge. Extraordinary times mean that mega church meetings in Louisiana are vectors of infection of other people. And so as painful as it is, I think it's appropriate for the authorities to say you can't have 1,800 people meet in a mega church uh, and then go out and spread the disease that way. It's a classic negative externality in economics. But that said, we have to be adamant. We are not granting permanent powers to governments to control us. We don't want the Chinese solution. They are very busy in China promoting how fabulous they have been. And we need to remind people that the authoritarianism of the Chinese Communist Party was one of the problems at the very beginning by suppressing doctors and punishing them We're speaking the truth. Well, and the data that we have from China, it, it, as far as we know, it, it might mean nothing. Um, I would like to bring in uh, to this conversation Jonathan Hani. He's also uh, joining us, uh, investor, founder of the Capitalist Pig Hedge Fund and a contributor for Fox Business. Uh, Jonathan, great to see you again. Hi, uh, Todd. I'm delighted to be with you, and I want to thank and congratulate all the sponsors of this really historic and amazing event for pulling this trans international conference uh, together. I was fortunate enough to speak in Israel at uh, the, Could you try? No, Siri, quiet. the Israeli Freedom <laughs> Conference about two years ago, 
to a large crowd in person, but I think we have an even larger historic crowd here today. So I'm really honored to be, and of course, with all the other esteemed panelists as well. So we, we were trying to talk to Yaron a bit before um, he sort of faded away somehow. Um, hopefully we'll get him back soon about the federal versus local responsibilities during such a crisis. We hear sometimes there's a lot of back and forth between the federal government, uh, the Trump administration, and certain governors, let's say in, in Michigan, even Andrew Cuomo here, here in New York, there's some back and forth. Although we do hear that there is uh, a very, you know, extent, uh, uh, bipartisan cooperation. It's not the time for politics, you know, politics aside. But, but, but when we try to measure the, 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 the response, let's say, or, or say, did the, the federal government act good enough? Did the governor act good enough in, in this crisis? What should we be looking at? Who, who, who shares the burden for what? Well, uh, my off-the-cuff <laughs> comment tells that it's not politics that we should be referring to. Politics uh, isn't the standard. I think Tom said it perfectly just a moment ago. It is principles. Uh, principles are more uh, needed and more vital in a crisis than any time before. Um, you know, my expertise, as you mentioned, I'm a, I'm a professional investor. And um, you know, my knowledge is, is really in terms of, I think, potentially what this has done to the markets and the economy and what it could do. I've actually prepared a, a, a short presentation that with your permission, I, I'll share with yeah. the audience. Um, let's see if, uh, can everyone see this? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I'm delighted to be with you. And my big picture here is gonna be, don't stimulate markets, free them. And it kind of speaks to your point, uh, Tal, a little bit your question of like, what's the right, political response here, well, it goes back to those principles. So let's not stimulate markets, let's free them. As I said, I've, I'm a professional investor. I've, uh, I was thinking about it, literally st stared at these monitors every day uh, for 20 years. I actually started in the 90s trading commodities on the floor, so I have a little bit of experience way back when screaming and, and, and uh, yelling on the floor of the exchanges. I'm also a, an analyst on Fox News Channel, so uh, you might have seen me in various uh, ages and states over the years talking about a lot of these issues. I'm also the editor of a new book uh, called A New Textbook of Americanism. I was able to speak with this uh, about this when I was at the Freedom Conference last time, and hats off to Boaz, uh, uh, who has, you know, amazingly published this in Hebrew as well. So uh, check out Boaz's website and, and my website as well, it's capitalistpig.com, to get it in Hebrew as well as in English. Um, so where are we, in my, in my estimation? Well, look, re reality exists. Uh, and COVID-19 is a stunning public health crisis. We really have never seen anything like this before. You, you, you can't solve it by ignoring it. Uh, and from what I've seen, it's obviously a huge economic crisis as well. Uh, just look at this is this morning's print of jobless claims going back to the late 1960s. And this is, I don't know, your own is the, truly the finance expert, a uh, Six Sigma type of event. You've really never seen this type of a tremendous shock to the economy in, in modern times. And it's the same thing I've read around the world in Israel. I mean, Israel, the Israeli unemployment numbers, I believe, were 4%, you know, two months ago, now 23% uh, unemployment in Israel. So this is, this is shocking. The response, and I believe our response as advocates for liberty in whatever context needs to be for freedom, uh, freedom in every context, because we know we're not just you know, dogmatic uh, ideo I, you know, ideo ideo ideologues, and you hear that oftentimes. No, it's not the time for ideas. We need action. But, but it's the ideas, and it's specifically only the free human mind that can produce Whatever the values that we need, whatever we need has to be produced by people's minds, uh, people's reasons. And this comes down to health, medical equipment. I mean, your own, uh, your Brooke on his broadcast and even today talked about, look, if we need you know, ways to solve some of these issues, with the, uh, the lack of supply and medical equipment, but it's also a bigger picture, the economy. I mean, the only way the economy can recover, the only way any economy can prosper is through that economic freedom. But, but, you know, 
what has been the response? Freedom? No. Uh, anything but. Anything but. It's been uh, from the get-go, inevitably, with some few exceptions, there's some, uh, some minor regulatory uh, 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 loosening of regulations here in the States. It's been more government controls. Uh, probably most notably, the $2 trillion stimulus bill passed, I guess, last week here. It's by far the biggest bill in U.S. history. But again, this is the same thing, obviously, that's going on in, in Israel. Not exactly the same. I, I'm not as familiar with Israel, but more government spending, more government intervention, more government control. And look, you don't, it, it, Ayn Rand, who I'm a supporter of and, and a believer of, she uh, famously advocates, she studied history. And, uh, and if you study some history, you'll find that time and time again, stimulus in all forms hurts the markets, hurts wealth creation, which is what we all want, and it, you know, it hurts people's lives. At the end of the day, it hurts uh, human life on Earth. And I, uh, I'm going to give you three examples. Again, we could. There's so much to learn about this, but hopefully, this inspires you to just uh, get out there to say why. If you really care about human life uh, right now, you're going to advocate for freedom. The one I know best, and I've, I've literally seen this since I was on the floor of the exchange, is trading halts in stock markets. Now, it might seem kind of I don't know not that important to you all, like, oh, who cares if so they stop trading? But you've been hearing a lot about it lately, right? Oh, stocks hit a, a circuit breaker, it fell so far, they, they, they were halted again. Uh, circuit breakers are being, you know, and, and, you know, basically the government comes in and says, stocks can only fall 7% and then we're going to, they stop trading. You can't trade if it goes, now they have, you know, different staggers along the way, but it's government putting an artificial floor or uh, on either how for, far markets can fall or how far they can rise over a certain time period. It's kind of ironic. They, they call it a cooling off period, like traders are gun, you know, gun nuts going to go shoot someone. <laughs> like, oh, we have to calm these irrational traders. And, and it's gotten so bad in Italy, in fact, that they're actually banning short selling. Uh, it's been talked about here in the States as well. And even this is not so unusual. There has been talk that gets worse when the market falls like it did yesterday, a thousand points in one day. People are saying, hey, look, maybe we need to shut down, have a banking holiday, shut the markets down, you know, everything calm down, let government figure it out, and then we'll let the market. This is, this is happening all over the place. And what you need to know is that does it create calm? Does it allow people to be more rational and think? No. It, no, it creates terrible, terrible volatility. I mean, this has been studied for decades, but by one estimate on a, a kind of a seminal uh, scholarly study, essentially creates about 230% more volatility than otherwise the case. And not only the day, then even the day after. So it creates volatility. And look, it makes sense. You don't have to be a, a scholar to understand what, you know, why would you bid to buy something when it's down 6%, when if it goes down 7%, you can't get out at all. You know what I mean? I, I tweeted and, and uh, on Twitter, you know, it's like, tell people the banks are gonna close, you will create a, a panic. Tell people the markets are gonna shut, you know, 100 points lower or that we can't change. And so you're gonna create a panic. Um, and we see, we've seen this time and time again. This is just from, I guess, uh, maybe two weeks ago. Market starts to fall. This is the S and P. No, this is the Dow Jones Industrial. Market starts to fall right at the open. Hits the trading halt. Da 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 da. -da. Trading is halted for 15 minutes, and then at the end of the day, you've wasted a day. But the market ends up closing exactly where it was. Now that's not always the case, but the point is, is that these trading halts are artificial impediments and wealth destruction into the market on a very micro level. They create volatility. All right, now you're saying, okay, what does this mean to me ultimately? Well, just extrapolate that. Extrapolate that pattern of force in wealth creation and price discovery across the entire global economy. Uh, and that's what we're seeing now. It's not just volatility, but it's creating tremendous, and it will create tremendous malinvestment. I got a little shit on Fox the other day because... Uh, I don't know, maybe Stuart Varney said, what do you think of the stimulus program? I said, it's going to create, it's, you know, it's, its size is terrible. 
He says, it's because it's, it's not big enough? I said, no, because it's way too big. It's going to create tremendous malinvestment. Uh, what is malinvestment? It's, it's a waste of money, in effect. It's like burning money and wasting people's time, wasting people's efforts that inevitably leads to economic losses. And this is what intervention on, on any scale, and certainly this scale, always does. Again, I mean, there's, the history on this is so well documented. These are recessions since World War II. The two worst by far are the ones that there were stimulus checks and ultra low interest rates, all that intervention. In 2001, uh, this was tried. And then most recently in, in 2007 and 2008, same pattern of make work projects, stimulus, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, this was a chart that ironically, Republicans used to pass around a lot. And it was correct back then, it's correct you know, back now. The, the Obama White House was saying, well, we need to spend uh, you know, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars Otherwise, unemployment could get as high as 9%. Well, guess what? They spent the hundreds of billions, and unemployment still went to 10%. Uh, and the recovery was ultimately a lot longer than it otherwise would have been. Uh, you might remember the Chevy Volt. You know, one of the terrible things now that's being discussed in 2020 is government, and it's just chilling to say it, but it's government taking equity stakes in U.S. companies. Now, look, they're just talking about airlines now, which is terrible to begin with, but, you know, I watch prices at all day long, and I don't think it's ultimately just going to be airlines. I think it's most likely going to be insurance companies, healthcare providers, and banks as well. But Obama basically bragged that, you know, and the Chevy Volt, you might remember, was a car that the government minders who owned GM at the time, who were managing GM at the time, they spearheaded it. Well, it was malinvestment. I mean, GM was losing 50 grand on every vote that they sold. So what was, what was the point of it? And of course, ultimately they pulled the plug on it as well. And the taxpayer and writ large growth uh, was the victim. We're seeing the same malinvestment today. History is repeating ourselves. This is, look, from March, this is a headline from yesterday, two days ago. All this malinvestment is creating a confusion in American Airlines. You have American Airlines now, U.S. Airlines. In fact, Trump was asked about this yesterday. What about these empty planes that are flying? They're flying because the stimulus package, the rescue package, requires them to preserve the service cap capacity, right? Got to keep those jobs. Got to keep people working. So they're burning through money even faster than they otherwise would if they have not been you know, evading reality by a, quote, stimulus package. So it's it's, we're seeing that malinvestment even now. It's like it's just started and we're already seeing money literally burn. Uh, and more important, people's time being wasted when it could be spent on moving on to something productive. Same thing now. Here's something being cooked up here in the U.S. Uh, ultra low interest rate loans to basically keep people, keep people employed, not given by a bank, of course, given by the government. And what the hell kind of a loan is a loan if it can be forgiven? I mean, this isn't a loan. It's like when Obama used to say the healthcare marketplace, it's an insult to marketplaces. A loan that is forgiven if you do with the, it's, it's not a loan, it's a, it's a redistribution of wealth and malinvestment on a grand scale. Seen this before, Herbert Hoover tried all of this back in thir 1932, uh, came up and cooked up with a lot of this stimulus program. You know, before, Roosevelt's great uh, or New Deal, it was Herbert's, Herbert tried, uh, Herbert Hoover essentially tried it out. And look, Trump is doing exactly the same thing, you know, uh, point after point after point after point, mortgage subsidies, pressuring people to hold off on layoffs, big public works projects, Trump's cooked up a, a zillion dollar uh, stimulus bill, uh, you know, to quote, put people on the job. So we're making the same mistakes again creates that malinvestment, all right? Again, we could do hours on that. Uh, but the third point I want to really briefly make is that it creates stagnation. Dr. Brooke, I think, said it exactly right, that, you know, Venezuela, it's kind of like become, I'm breaking my own rule by even saying the name, but like the Hitler thing, like, oh, it's as bad as Hitler, that's so easy. And saying something is as bad as Venezuela is also pretty easy because Venezuela is terrible, but it's not the only potential outcome of this type of intervention in the economy. I think Japan probably provides a much more realistic and, I don't know, equally <coughs> horrifying, but certainly horrifying potential. You know, Japan has been stimulating. This chart only goes up to 08. You can tack on another 12 years. They have been stimulating for decades. Uh, mega stimulus in Japan. 
And what's been the net result? Stagnant wages, stagnant GDP, falling even further behind the U.S., uh, certainly than its competitors in the modern world. The stock market is still well below its 1989 peak in Japan. Uh, and real estate prices, you know, we've got to prop up those mortgage, uh, keep down mortgage rates, got to keep real estate prices uh, high. I mean, even now, 31 years after, real estate prices have still not rebounded to that peak level. So the whole point of having markets, I think, at least my, my POV these days, is that they have to reflect reality, not government control. No, they, the whole point of having a market, unless you're just pretending it, the whole point is, is they're only useful unless they're reflected in reality. And all this intervention is creating the volatility. It's creating malinvestment. It's creating the stagnation. So this is now more than ever we need to advocate for free markets because, as I said, only the human mind can produce the values needed to solve the health and economic dislocation. That exists. COVID is a reality. But we can solve it as creative entrepreneurs in all of our unique contexts. Uh, now more than ever, government needs to get out of the way. Uh, and we're seeing it. I mean, this has just essentially started a couple of days ago, but this notion of dining bonds, you know, you can essentially buy $100 worth of your favorite uh, restaurant, give them 75 bucks today, and in a year, whatever it is, it's a discounted uh, gift certificate. You can support it. It's a, it's a way I love. It's kind of securitizing uh, 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 restaurants and being able to support them at the same time. Here in Chicago, one of the world's most well-known restaurants, look, they have bills to pay as well. Alinea is all of a sudden doing to-go orders. Uh, you know, these are menus that usually cost $300 a person. They're figuring out it, a way to do it, you know, at low cost, keeping some of their people employed, keeping some of life moving on. Um, and of course, on a much more kind of practical level, I mean, look what uh, Dyson is doing. I mean, these are the geniuses who are saving our lives. Don't make them sit at home watching YouTube videos. Let them figure it out. Let them take the risks. Uh, let companies retool. Uh, and, and, and that's the only thing that ultimately is going to save us and can save us if a government gets out of the way. So crisis, as I said, and as Tom said, I think so eloquently, it's not when we should abandon principles. It really is when we need principles the most. And I applaud all of you all over the world who are joining us these days because you're truly part of the solution in, in advocating for these ideas, especially now. Now, I'll say one more thing. Uh, Steve Jobs famously always had one more thing. I did promise a stock pick or two in my promo video, so I'm going to get to that. But first, I just want to thank you all before I switch back to my own uh, photo and just thank you all, especially our sponsors, for, uh, for including me today. Um, if uh, we do have some questions, Jonathan. We have some questions. Uh, Boaz is sending me questions from the audience, but I wanted to follow up on what you presented because you mentioned Hoover, you mentioned Roosevelt uh, and the New Deal. But, you know, people around the world are now wondering. They say the huge 2008 bailouts and money printing following the financial crisis never caused inflation. So why wouldn't we just write the same successful prescription again and save the economy? I just challenge all those assumptions. Uh, you know, it, it, it didn't cause inflation, but it did cause, and you know, this was kind of a common rallying cry of, uh, of a lot of so-called fiscal conservatives. You know, they're not, they're absent in America now these days, but it did cause the most moribund recovery in modern history. It was really only in the last six months that you started to see any of those traditional measures of, you know, I mean, it, it and he, uh, you know, it was pointed out, it, the recovery through the Obama stimulus recovery was slower than oftentimes growth during the Carter administration in the 1970s, you know, one and 2% uh, growth. And all that uh, expenditure, which was only checked, thankfully, to the opposition of a lot of Republicans who demanded a, uh, what did they call it? Oh, the sequester bill at the time. So um, it, you know, people chalk up the bailout of, uh, of a, a GM and all the money spending and the money printing at that time as a, as a success. What they don't see are the unforeseen consequences uh, that you always see as a result, most notably, just a terribly moribund economy for a decade or more. 
And, and I want to go back again to the New Deal because it's something that we keep hearing in Israel. Uh, some lawmakers have brought us up uh, over the last two weeks. Uh, I think Ofer Shelach from the Blue and White Party uh, was one of them. Uh, if, <laughs> they bring it as an example of how the U.S. government saved the economy after the 1929 crisis. How come these narratives are so wrong and yet they prevail? Well, I think some of it is, a, well, I think ultimately it's, I think ultimately it's philosophic. Uh, when you say someone's going to lose their job, people are losing their jobs, I, you know, and this is why I think ultimately it's a philosophical battle is that people's response is government has to do something. We have to do something. Government has to step in and do something. People are losing their jobs. And boy, well, we can't have a, you know, Trump, especially, and many Americans talk in this nationalistic tone. We have to have an airline industry. We have to have a steel industry. Uh, and again, it's abandoning those principles. One um, element of history that is quite helpful uh, at all is people might not remember before the Great Depression that began, you know, after the, essentially after the stock market crash and when all that intervention began, there was a less than year depression in 1920 that no one even talks about. And it wasn't Herbert Hoover, it was William Harding, who did exactly the opposite of everything that's being advocated economically today. He slashed taxes, he cut uh, federal spending, the government did not lower interest rates, the Federal Reserve did not lower interest rates to stimulate the economy. And unemployment went, I believe, from 12% to 2% within a year and a half, within two years of the economy. So it's called here in the US, the you know, it's a forgotten depression. So the history has been completely told wrong. Uh, it's a government saved the economy in 2008. And what's underlying that, map, that uh, ignorance, I think, is that altruism. Because the sense is, well, we just can't leave people free. What would happen? People, you know, and it, 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 it denigrates the creative entrepreneur and also the benevolent, the benevolent individual who would help people who they cared about who were honestly in need in times like this. Jonathan, I want to stop you right uh, there because I want to take it uh, to Europe right now, back to Slamming for a second, because we talked a lot about what's happening in Israel and the stimulus package that they're uh, debating now. They're also struggling to form a government in Israel. That's a whole different uh, aspect. But uh, Fleming, uh, what is being done or, or debated uh, in, in regards to saving the economy where, where you are now, in Denmark or... I mean, Sweden is in a different situation right now because their economy is still somewhat alive. But, but what are you hearing there? Um, well, I think that um, in, in, in Europe, most governments are shutting down businesses because we are in an, in an emergency situation. Uh, I agree with that, 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 that in fact, um, people are being harmed with, if they are being infected by people who are infected by, by the virus and, and therefore it's legitimate to uh, restrict uh, some, some freedoms in, in this situation. But the price for the economy is enormous and as in the US, uh, European governments are stepping in the huge um, money packages uh, and, and my concern is that that, that the vast majority of uh, private business in Europe will be dependent on the government for years, if not decades to come. Because who is going to finance uh, 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 this uh, uh, lockdown of the, of the economy? Taxpayers. So, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that in the aftermath of, of, of this uh, lockdown, when, when the economy starts to run again, uh, taxes will be uh, increased um, and it will it will have a negative effect on 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 wealth creation uh, in in uh, in Europe as well mm -hmm. I'm hearing that Iran Brook is back with us so Iran we want to take it to you because you've been listening in um, you know, we talked about the 2008 bailouts, the New Deal, the stimulus package, and now in Israel, uh, by, by the way, they're talking, I think, about 80, no, it's 80 billion shekel, which are around $22 billion uh, uh, size of a, of a stimulus package, quite controversial. Um, 
You're on. You're with us. Yeah, I mean, 22 billion is like, uh, you know, chump change given what we're doing in the United States. 2.2 <laughs> trillion dollars uh, stimulus package. Uh, look, the history of economics is taught in distorted and perverted ways. The fact is that the New Deal uh, unemployment when uh, when FDR took over in in 1932 or 19 January 1933 was just as high in 1938 as it was in 1933. All of the stimulus and job programs and all of the things that he supposedly saved the United States they did nothing. They perpetuated a depression. We really the United States didn't exit the Great Depression until the end of World War II until 1945. When, uh, when government spending declined, regulations declined, and went back on a, on, you know, to, to a semi, semi, very semi-free market. 2008, people talk about the stimulus and the Fed and Bernanke and Paulson. I mean, much of the 2008 crisis, in my view and in the view of many economists, was caused by the panic and, and just a sense of uh, that the people running things had no clue what they were doing, that politicians were messing things up. So a lot of what happened in 2008 was caused by politics and the Fed. And then the outcome was slow economic growth for 10 years. Pathetic economic growth. I mean, Trump likes to hail his economy as the best ever. But with all due respect, 2% economic growth is, you don't write home about 2%. 2% is like, is, is really, really weak. Um, and so we had 10 years of very slow economic growth, and one could argue the growing of bubbles and growing of malinvestment and misallocation of capital, that the crisis now is worse, I think, in markets and elsewhere because of all the things that were done under the Obama administration and during the 08, 09 crisis by the Fed. So these things build on one another. In many respects, the 08 crisis, I mean, we don't have time to go into this now, but in many respects, the 08 crisis is a consequence of the security regulations that FDR passed in 33 and 34 uh, during, during the Great Depression. These things, these government interventions come back to bite us, sometimes decades later. But the fact is, you know, markets work. And if we left markets free, if we left markets alone, yes, there's sometimes down phases, Yes, there's certain times where governments need to step in uh, to help, like with the coronavirus, to help maybe isolate certain groups of people and maybe have emergency measures for short periods of time to, to, to test and to isolate the people who actually carry the virus. But there is no excuse for the government to be interfering in the economy, to, to shut down businesses on a massive scale with no end date, and to, and to suggest that it can cure the problems that it itself creates. It can't, it creates greater problems every time it intervenes. Mm -hmm. I wanna take some questions from the audience. Boaz is sending me your questions, everyone. Uh, we really appreciate your engagement here. Um, ben Bloom is asking, do people support economic war against China? Um, isn't the global economic system too dependent on Chinese goods, which makes situations like the coronavirus more dangerous? What does economic war even mean? I mean, it, it, it is, a, it is a, it's a terrible analogy. War is when you blow up stuff and you destroy. Trade is a win-win relationship. Trade is a, is a relationship from which you benefit. Now, China has problems, and we should call China on those problems, and we should acknowledge those problems, and we should use the bully pulpit to, to condemn Chinese authoritarianism and Chinese oppression and what Chinese and misinformation and what they did uh, during this crisis. But, you know, if we had zero tariffs now in the United States right now, then as our economy is declining, the Chinese economy slowly is getting revived. Mexico hasn't really had much of an economic shutdown. It, you know, we could be trading with them. We could be benefiting from the fact that they're producing. We could be consuming the things that they are making right now. And, and indeed, we are, right? Uh, there still is the largest trade going on. But what we should be doing as a consequence of this is two things. Increasing trade, lowering barriers, lowering tariffs, and at the same time, 
morally condemning bad behavior, morally condemning authoritarian regimes when they act in authoritarian ways. And China, there's plenty to condemn. There's plenty to go after. You know, uh, Fleming talked about civil liberties. Civil liberties don't, to a large extent, don't exist anymore in China. They've been in decline over the last five years. I mean, they never, never were great to begin with, but certainly over the last four or five years, they've been seriously in decline and they're at a low, they're, they're getting closer and returning to the days of, 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 you know, totalitarianism. And we need to condemn that. But I think stopping trading with them is a, would be a massive mistake, uh, both for us and for the prospects of liberty within China. And I, I, if I can jump in, I think that is the key issue. I mean, I don't think people are talking so much about economic war, but there, there are voices calling for decoupling uh, with China. Uh, isn't that the same, Yaron? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean the, 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 the US economy shouldn't be dependent on Chinese supply chains when it comes to pharmaceuticals and and other you know key yeah, key products. That, I think that's what that's what some uh, national security people are are calling for. Uh, would you be against that? Is Iran, Iran, can you hear Fleming? I'm not so sure. Um, let me take it to Tom for a second because uh, I cannot uh, hear Iran. Um, we'll circle back to it a bit later. Uh, Tom, you're with me, right? I am indeed. Um, All right. So, yeah, take it. Go ahead. Um, so, so I, I wanted to ask you this because in Israel, it's been reported, reported time and again over recent weeks that President Trump he seems to be disconnected from the reality on the ground in his own country. I heard this sentence repeated so many times by Israeli media. And there's also, I have to tell you, as an Israeli expert living here in the U.S., there's a sense among Israelis of, whoa, we're so much ahead of America in fighting this pandemic. Uh, as, as if it's a competition, you know, between countries. Uh, and and, 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 and who, who has a greater stimulus package and, and who will give, you know, the, the, which, which government is going to give more money to their own people, um, you know, uh, to, to withstand this crisis. Um, but, but I've seen polls here in the U.S. showing that the president is actually gaining support these days. And that's what I want you maybe to explain. There's a Gallup poll that showed that 60% of Americans approve of Trump's handling of the coronavirus crisis. And on, fri on, on Friday, I think President Trump's approval rating hit 45.8%, uh, which is the highest since January 2017. So what are you reading into this? I think that the explanation there is psychological and not economic or political. In a crisis, people want to run and stand behind daddy's legs. And Trump, despite the grotesque incompetence of the government response here, authentically grotesque, the misinformation, the outright lies that have to be walked back by, by all the experts afterward, uh, he stands there and talks to people every day. And so it's like hearing daddy say, things are okay, I have it under control. This is a natural and normal response. The crises, uh, the perception of a threat generates what Karen Stenner, the political psychologist, called authoritarian groupiness, collectivism, and the desire for the man on the white horse, or in this case, the big daddy, to save us. Give him more power and he'll save us. I think that's what's happening. The objective record, going back to Jonathan Honig's point about reality, has been incompetence, simple incompetence on the part of our government. And I should add one more thing. Um, Jonathan Honig's wisdom is scarcer than hand sanitizer in the United States right now. A very difficult to find people who will speak this way because the Republicans have signed up with Trumpy authoritarian collectivism, nationalism, scapegoating of minorities. Uh, I personally find it quite hateful when they talk about the Chinese virus as if the virus had some nationality, and I think that fuels hatred of Asian Americans, which we've seen some evidence of, including in London, a Chinese uh, 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 descended people being beaten up savagely on the street by nationalists. Uh, so I think the Trump administration has been grossly incompetent. Unfortunately, the other side of the 
of the spectrum said, my God, if only we'd have even more government. And if Trump had only had more power, everything would be okay. And the example is the fact that the federal government forbade private uh, testing companies from producing tests. It was illegal. FDA and CDC sent out uh, orders, don't test people. We have it under control. They forbade them to use tests that had already been approved by World Health Organization, were available January 10th in South Korea and in Germany. They had private labs already producing them. They said no. And it was one doctor, Dr. Helen Chu, she's a hero in my book, uh, in Seattle, who said, you know, the hell with you. We have people dying here. We don't know exactly why. I'm going to get one of these tests, not the faulty ones the government produced that didn't work, by the way. I'm going to get one of these ones that works, and I'm going to test people, and she proved it. So what they're saying now is, oh, God, the other side says, if only more government had been there to cut through the bureaucratic red tape and obstacles created by the rest of the government. I think that's madness. What we needed was to get rid of those crazy controls in the first place. So one point to watch for on social media, the Competitive Enterprise Institute has been putting out the hashtag never needed. These restrictions were never needed. We should get rid of them. Yes, cut through the bureaucracy, but get rid of them. There are four federal agencies that regulate respirators in the United States. Well, gosh, it's amazing. It's difficult to get them. One uh, fashion designer in New York had to get a permission tweet from the governor of New York, a personal permission to be able to convert his dressmaking shop into producing face masks because it was illegal. They couldn't do that. So the governor had to say, I give you my blessing. I personally will tweet unto, thy, unto thee the right to save lives. This has got to go. Can I just, mm -hmm. you know, first let me apologize for the terrible internet here in Puerto Rico um, that keeps knocking me out. I agree completely with Tom. Tom, what, what Tom just said is absolutely right. Look, at times of crisis, people like to rally, not just around daddy, but around the flag. And particularly in, our, in, our, in this time of, of tribalism and collectivism, which is on the rise in America, which is on the rise all over the world, people like to rally around a strong leader who seems to know what he's doing, which is dubious about Trump, right? But, but at least speaks and commands authority. And that's, that, I think, explains what's happening with Trump's approval rating. But think about it this way. When after 9-11... George W. Bush, who I think responded in pretty pathetic way to 9-11, um, approval rating jumped up to 95%, 95%. So 60% in a time of an emergency is not that high, right? It's not, it's not, a, it's not a particularly high given, given the tendency of people to, to rush uh, towards anybody who seems to be strong. I mean, look at the Democrats rallying around uh, Andrew Cuomo because he seems presidential because Andrew Cuomo seems like a strong leader. Uh, this is a sad tendency that we all have. And again, I think the consequence of that is we give too much power to politicians during these times, and we never get it back. We never get those freedoms back. And uh, indeed, all the deregulation that we've heard that's going on in America today, it's not going to last, unfortunately. Uh Tom, you know, there, there's one thing we haven't talked about so far today, and that's uh, the health system. We have so many people tuning in, listening to us, uh, Yaron, Tom, and, and, and Jonathan, and, and Fleming, uh, from all around the world. We have people from, from Israel, and we have people from Europe, uh, many also here in America. But you know that many people outside the United States, and this is something that I found out, found out since uh, having moved here, are under the impression that the U.S. health system is, is some sort of a beacon of free market. And I've seen many posts on social media of people praising their country's universal health care systems as if the corona crisis is going to make the argument once and for all against private health care. Uh, so here's my question to you, gentlemen. How do you explain to people that the U.S. health system is not really so much what, what they might have had in mind. 
Uh, Tom, do you, would you like to take uh, it? Let me just jump off. I think we should look around the world for solutions that have worked. And the South mm -hmm. Koreans, not to say everything in South Korea is wonderful, but they had the right response to this going back to 2015 when they had their MERS um, uh, outbreak. Uh, they said, oh my God, we have to enable and free private enterprise to respond to these things. And they were very quick out of the box because they did not box up private enterprise. The U.S. has a command and control system. We don't allow something that many countries do allow, which is if a drug is passed some tests in Israel or, or Germany or Australia, why should it have to go through the same tests for seven years in the U.S.? It doesn't make any sense. So there's no reciprocity in the United States. And that's the thing we should do. And many other countries have done that. But the U.S. has a highly protectionist system that we don't allow those drugs or, or medical devices to be imported from abroad. Uh, it's very restricted. The other element, of course, is there's uh, a great deal of crazy controls and massive amounts of money washing in that makes there's not it makes it almost impossible to have a market in many services. There are no prices. Go to a doctor in America or a hospital and say, oh, that's interesting. How much will that cost? I've had that experience. I say, uh, what, what do you mean? I said, how much will it cost? I don't know. You'll just get the bill. Yep. Well, that's not a market if you can't engage in, in looking for prices like a, a consumer. That's crazy. So you have third-party payment systems, which is locked in by our tax code, goes back to World War II. So everyone, because your medical care is a non-taxable benefit, you get it from your employer. Well, the consequence is you're limited in job change. It has negative impacts on the labor market. And in addition, in effect, what you're getting is prepaid medical care rather than actual insurance. So if you look <coughs> at real insurance markets, prices tend to go down. But we have almost no health insurance. It's actually just prepaid medical care. Well, think about that in any other service. Imagine you had prepaid automobile care. Well, you get your, take your car in all the time. The bills will go up and up and up. It's not insurance in the United States. It's a prepaid system. Then in addition, you can't have competition across state lines. Well, that would be anarchy. Oh, my God, that someone in New Jersey could buy medical insurance available in Pennsylvania. Texas. which is Well, or even just the next state. Uh, that's illegal. That's strictly forbidden. So on and on, there's a cascade of regulations and controls that has the effect of driving up the price of medical care. Now, there are some advantages in the American system. It's not all bad. It's not the Soviet Union, but it is definitely not laissez-faire. Uh, and in some regards, it's less of a free market than some European countries have. So let's ask Europe. Let's go to Europe. Fleming, um, just give us a sense if, 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 you, if you can compare, for example, uh, I know the, the, the Swedish health system has, has its own problems. Um, I, and maybe that should be the question asked. Is there even an ideal health system in the world? Uh, even in routine times, it's not uncommon for ambulances in Japan to cruise the streets, right, to find an emergency room that could take in a patient. Um, you have Canadians complaining about uh, wait time for health care. Nurses work 24-hour shifts. Uh, there's a lack of beds in certain hospitals. The Swedish system uh, suffers similar problems despite a government spending, which is the third highest in the European Union. And, and if we, we, we talk about the British NHS, then, I mean, we, we shouldn't even get started. So what, what is really the vision of, of the ideal healthcare system, one that can better deal with, with a pandemic? I, I, I think uh, just to give a little historical perspective, I mean, the European welfare state has been challenged uh, within, you know, the past 10, 20 years. And in fact, some things have been outsourced to uh, private in enterprises. But just to give you one funny example from Denmark uh, that might be telling, when the Danish healthcare system wasn't prepared for this as well, but, uh, and, and they lacked uh, uh, respirators, but it turned out that a, a private hospital in Denmark had a lot of these uh, respirators and the government said, well, okay, we need them, so we're going to take them away from you. Um, but I think, um, I think 
I mean, I agree with with uh, with Tom on the uh, on the state of uh, of of, of uh, the healthcare system in the U.S. and the incompetence of government. And in Europe, the narrative is very much that the U.S. is a disaster at the moment. But I think we in Europe underestimate the strength of civil society in uh, in in America. And I think uh, that the U.S. will come will come back in spite of the government uh, and due to this reality of self-organization around local communities. In, in, in Europe, unfortunately, most people sit and wait for the government. That's not the case in, uh, in the US. Uh, people take their fate in, in their own hands and they, they start you know, initiating uh, things uh, uh, and, and circumventing uh, uh, the government. And therefore, I'm pretty con confident that uh, at the end of the day, uh, um, uh, my big concern, I, I have a bigger concern regarding uh, uh, Europe uh, than, uh, than, than the US, while at the moment it, 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 it looks the other way around. Tal, I'll, I'll quickly, briefly jump in. I mean, uh, absolutely discredit that false claim, as you said, that people for some reason believe that there's any semblance of a free market in healthcare in America is like ludicrous on its face. I mean, there's explicit socialized healthcare for people, I believe, older 65 with Medicare. But even before Obama was, Obamacare was passed 10 years ago, even then government already paid for, I believe, 50% of all healthcare expenditures. So, you know, just like in 2008, they said, oh, it was, it was free market, uh, 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 free market economics across the economy, that same fallacy is being promoted today. And I, Fleming, I, uh, it's great to see you, by the way. I'm such a fan and a, um, just appreciative of all that you've done over the years. Um, I, I wish I had your confidence, frankly, about Americans, because there does seem to be that sense of, well, government's got to figure it out. And, uh, you know, as, as Tom and others have mentioned, there's losses that perspective of how can a creative mind's figure this in the absence of coercion. I mean, maybe now, for example, Apple, who famously has sat on, you know, all these billions of dollars for years, who knows, maybe they can open up for-profit, exclusive boutique-only hospitals. Maybe they roll up these boutique doctors that have been popping up. Maybe you pay, you know, 10 grand a month and it's very expensive to start for. They figure it out. The only way we can get any type of wealth created is by those creative individual minds. But the feeling now is like, well, we've got to have government to fix us, and that's leading us down the wrong path. Yaron, is there an ideal healthcare system? I, I don't, maybe, is there Yaron? <laughs> maybe that should be my question. Um, all right. Um, let me continue, um, and I'll, I'll go to Tom here. You know what I found very interesting, uh, gentlemen, how in recent weeks, supporters of almost every ideology that we know, they feel as if the corona crisis is emboldening their initial beliefs, uh, meaning green activists believe that it's a wake up call from Mother Earth. Uh, socialists believe that the pandemic is the ultimate proof of why we need a universal health system. Maybe that's the reason why Bernie is, by the way, still in the race. Maybe it will generate some momentum at the end of it. We don't know. Um, and then you have conservatives that are now saying, oh, we told you so about the national debt. Uh, what do you think should be our main takeaway once this wave of, of pandemic is, is over? What should this experience teach us for, for the future? Well, let's do a round here. Jonathan, we'll start with you. Well, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. You left off actually the mystics, uh, the, 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 the uh, religious people who are saying, well, this is God getting us, you know, God is paying us back for living, I don't know, a sinful life. So, uh, you know, it harkens back, Tal, to a famous quote of a, of a democratic, kind of a famous democratic uh, uh, leader here in the States, democratic big D, the democratic party, Rahm Emanuel, happens to be a Jewish guy, but uh, famously said, uh, never let a crisis go to waste. So of course, they're all taking advantage of this crisis to push, push their own uh, agenda. Uh, Dr. Brooke, I think, has as a nat as a theorized, and I think he's right that this is going to hasten the, nat the explicit nationalization of healthcare in America. Uh, certainly, going to uh, explicitly hasten fascism in terms of government holding uh, policies. And I think the only way to do it is to stress the practicality of free markets and and stress the history, which demonstrates every time that type this time this type of intervention has been tried, it's failed on its face. 
Let's continue this round. Um, Tom, what do you think this experience should, should teach us from, for, for, for the future? What should be the, the takeaway? How do you see it? Well, there are a number of points that I think we should keep in mind. Uh, one thing, I put in a link on the chat box to a, a very nice, very useful article by Gonzalo Schwartz uh, on human ingenuity and <laughs> calling on that to solve this problem. So I encourage people to uh, look at that and read it has a lot of good information in it. Second thing is that we have to remind people that when you need more ventilators, you have to get someone to make them or respirators or whatever it happens to be. And that means enterprise. Waving a magic wand doesn't create more of them. So we need to have enterprise that's free to do that. There is a, I, I don't wanna use the term silver lining, but there are some lessons here that we need to hammer home and do it in a responsible and thought, thoughtful way, not sounding like outside critics or carpers. Uh, and that is that these restrictions on the implementation of medical devices should never have been there. The United States, to take a very simple example, has certificate of need requirements. They deliberately restricted the number of ventilators in communities, because if you wanted to install one, you have to get a certificate of need approval from the government and who gets to comment on it and veto it? It's other owners of ventilators. It's just a cartel. And that has restricted the ability of the market to respond because you have to go to this cumbersome procedure and may be told no. Get rid of those things. There's no reason to stop people from implementing or bringing about new services in the market and being responsive. So I think there are some things that we need to learn from this. And there are points that can be made in a non-ideological way. You don't have to sound like an ideologue to say, look, did that make sense that we deliberately restricted the numbers of clinics and deliberately restricted the number of ventilators? Why don't we just get rid of that? And if someone wants to install a ventilator in a clinic, they shouldn't have to ask permission of all of their competitors before doing so. That's the reality of the American healthcare system. We need to get rid of it. And finally, we do remind people that it's, it's just silly mysticism, frankly, to think, oh, there wouldn't have been a pandemic if we had universal health care of the sort they have in, uh, oh, Italy. Yes, that's the country. Uh, Bernie Sanders wants the Italian system, uh, and they got the pandemic too. I'm not going to claim they got the pandemic because of the medical system. They got it because of a virus. But the idea that implementing the Italian medical system in other countries will pre prevent pandemics is, it's laughable. It, in a very sad way, I don't like to laugh about this, but no, you, it's absurd. Sure. Or, or deal better with a pandemic once uh, the outbreak is there. Uh, Yaron, I hear you're back with us, your thoughts here. Yaron, I'm not sure. So Yaron is, is, is popping uh, back and forth, I don't know, from, from this conversation. I think his internet is oh, here up is. and down. Oh, you see him? Jonathan, if not, I have a question here for you. Let's try it. Okay, so let's take it. Um, Boa sent me this question. I, I don't know who, who sent it. Um, here we go. Since the dollar is tied to gold, and in the last, <clears throat> excuse me, 10 years, there has been doubts if the Federal Reserve has any gold left, then money is not worth anything except for what people believe it's worth. So isn't, um, isn't stimulus, isn't, isn't maybe the stimulus package uh, 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 coming to make people believe things are okay, the only thing that can in reality be done? Uh, do, do you get the question here? Yeah, I, th I think I get, I get the element of it, and it kind of goes back to how the to a lot of our, our point, and our point here is that the, the stimulus supposedly- Mal investment. Yeah, malinvestment, and also it creates an uncertainty that otherwise, I mean, look, if you went to the doctor, you would want the doctor to tell you exactly what's going on. That what's, that's what prices and markets do. Uh, but, you know, uh, the stimulus, so can you trust prices in the marketplace now? You don't know, is it a real price? Is it a result of the stimulus and all the intervention? That, the same thing that goes with the value of all these rights. You know, I'm looking even on my screen here, I mean, the value of corporate bonds in the last three weeks has vacillated, I don't know, by 20 something percent. Uh, that type of volatility only exists when government starts getting involved because people have to think, well, now I'm not just looking at it as blowing a good risk, but like, well, what about the stimulus and 
it drives up that volatility and it drives out that liquidity. Uh, so it has just that that opposite impact when it comes to trying to to calm markets and uh, and create calm. Jonathan, we've seen stocks plummeting um, in, in recent weeks. Uh, first, tell us wh where's all the money going to? Well, uh, um, I, I, I prepared a I prepared a few ideas of where I'm investing and what I'm looking at. Tall, share briefly if you want. I mean, uh, not not uh, uh, explicit recommendations, but um, you know, I did have these uh, stunning uh, 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 matches. Uh, Printed up with a quote from Ayn Rand, I think is pretty the important now. The smallest minority on the earth. Yeah, read it. Well, one idea is just cash, Tal. Cash, I think, is important now. I mean, un unfortunately, government intervention prompts you to be short-term th thinking. But if you've ever wanted a day trade, I'll previously say th these are markets that are great for day trading. But the intervention itself makes it very difficult to have any type of long-term perspective because they're literally coming up with the stimulus, the volatility on a day-by-day -day basis. I'll give you one, another idea. I'm looking at a BDRY. This is an ETF that tracks shipping rates. Um, to your own Brooks point, I mean, shipping from China and all, all around the world, it is a lifeline to any economy, especially the US economy. Those shipping rates have been decimated uh, as a result of this crisis, obviously. I think that they'll bounce back. I think we can't bounce back unless they bounce back. So I'm looking at that as well. And uh, one more I'll put on the list is, is, uh, as well. I don't want to monopolize it, but uh, the reveal there is PPLT. This is an ETF that tracks pl uh, platinum prices. Platinum is a severely depressed. And Tal, I'm worried about an environment, you know, that frankly you saw during the 1970s. You've seen, saw it since the 1990s in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Japan, where hoarding essentially starts to become a, an economic reality. This is an asset that potentially could hedge against that. As always, do your own due diligence, but here are some ways that I'm trying to protect myself and maybe make some money. Another question that I have here, what do you think about crypto currencies? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not involved in crypto as well. It, to me, it, it's trading like any other <laughs> risk asset. I mean, again, I, I'm not, people get very passionate about, about crypto. Um, it's performed very poorly as of lately. In my sense, is crypto honestly is an asset uh, that was born as a result of the government intervention that Dr. Brooke and uh, and uh, Tom have alluded to. Only with those ultra low interest rates, you know, could you create a multi billion dollar asset class that's essentially based on nothing and has no practical use, at least at this point. So I'm I'm skeptical of crypto uh, and uh, can't say that I'm involved in it at this time. All right, one more question to you, Jonathan, uh, that I have here from the chat. Um, I understand you are opposed to government offering stimulus to companies in times like this. Do you suggest leaving companies and, and economies to collapse? Isn't it better to offer stimulus packages based? Uh, uh, I don't understand the rest of it. But sure. uh, so if you don't want to have a, you don't have companies, you know, it's like. Uh, you know, there's far better economists on this line. I, I don't want to uh, monopolize, but to mm -hmm. me, trader, in, in a, as a student of objectivism, it's goes back back to that idea of it's pretty evil to evade reality. So if a company is bought back at stock with uh, borrowed money and bought back at stock, if no one's flying, it's pretty evil to evade reality and say they're not going to have to make some uh, changes to their ma their employment, for example. But there's this tremendous fear, Tal, about well, what if a company goes bankrupt? Look, American, Delta, and United have all been bankrupt within the last 20 years. Planes kept flying, stockholders lose money, and bondholders, all, oftentimes a little more wise, wise and haven't seen, haven't seen what happened to the company, take over. Um, so that's what always can't be seen. You know, uh, Ron Mises and others, Henry Hazlitt, have talked about economics as a second and third level uh, consequences. That's what it's all about. So if, for example, you could see that regulation uh, taken away. I mean, what if in the next five years you had uh, Microsoft, Apple, uh, um, uh, Costco, and Walmart all getting into the hospital game, into the healthcare game? Maybe, as I said, they, it's like a subscription model, like a gym. You know, we. I mean, Amazon is talking about it. It could be something really tremendous, but it's what we can't see, and that's why we need these creative geniuses to get in the game, and that's why government got to get out. Mm -hmm. Tom, uh, let's you. Tom, Tom, let's bring you in. Uh, I should make a, a quick point that 
about stimulus versus liquidity in the market and having the banking system respond. And then in addition, a, an insurance policy. We really don't need stimulus. This is a supply problem. It's not collapsing demand or liquidating previous malinvestments. This is a supply shock. People are not enabled, are able to produce wealth. It's the effective wealth that creates demand in the economy. The problem is people can't work. That's the problem. Now, there is an issue involved in this. You think about friends of mine who are now out of work. Uh, what's going to happen if they can't pay their rent? And if this goes on for three more months? I do think that, we, that it is reasonable to say government may be an insurer of last resort in such circumstances. But don't fool yourself into calling it stimulus. We don't want people to go out and buy more stuff in the stores. The whole point is that that kind of behavior should be limited to limit the spread of a contagious disease, a public health problem. But I don't think it's unreasonable to say that those people who are on uh, hourly jobs, uh, that suddenly they can't work, they're in the service industry, the service, the service uh, that, uh, they, that they... Oops, I'm getting a feedback. Getting a feedback. An echo, yeah. An echo, yeah. An echo. Uh, uh, that they, sh that they sh should not be, should able, not be to able to support themselves. So call it that, deal with that as an emergency measure, but it isn't stimulus. That's not what the economy needs. And the example that Jonathan gave, which I heard on the radio this morning, of the airplanes flying an entire jet with two passengers and That's seven crew members, uh, all so that they can continue to get the money. <coughs> doesn't make any sense. We're just throwing wealth away. If you say, look, if you close down, the government will help to provide funding that comes at the expense of all of us to make sure we don't end up with 25% of the population unable to support themselves. I understand that. And that point should be made in that fashion, but not as a stimulus uh, that just doesn't make any sense. It's incoherent. Uh, no, there are certain risks restrictions on on what companies can do with with the money they receive from the government uh as part of the relief bill uh, what, what's the reasoning behind that and, and do you think it's really necessary you know they can't buy their own stock and and they if you pay a certain amount from the money that you receive and it goes directly to pay your your, your workers then it, it it's just it counts as a not as a loan right it counts just as as, as money given by the government to whom are you directing that? Um, take it, Tom. Well, I it's think yours. The, the, the big danger here is it is coming with all kinds of controls. And Jonathan mentioned, first off, requiring airplanes to fly empty and burn up uh, uh, fuel. This doesn't make any sense. It's a traditional Washington, D.C. stupidity. But then the other element is that Steve Mnuchin announced they're going to look into buying them. This is extremely dangerous. If what you say is, as insurer of last resort, we're going to enable the payment of wages at some percentage for people who currently are saying, uh, we can't feed our kids right now because the whole economy shut down. It's a cost that will be borne by all of us. But to then say, oh, in exchange, we get to own all these private firms, that's just a catastrophe. And we really have to draw the line at that in a, a very robust way. We don't want government to end up buying all of these companies in America. Uh, it, it's a horror. And I keep telling my left uh, wing friends who are demanding this, do you really want Donald Trump, this person you hate and have demonized so much, to own all of those companies? This would be disastrous. And I think that we need to pitch that and say, do you want that to happen? And some of them have said, oh, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Because they don't understand government isn't the celestial deity. It's just a bunch of people. It's just a bunch of people. And we don't want those people to have that kind of control over our lives. Yeah. Uh, uh, quick, or not. Quick, quickly, quickly jump in if I could, Tom. I mean, like we... In the States, it's very common to kind of make fun of the post office, whose service is inevitably terrible when compared to private market alternatives like, like FedEx and UPS. 
And I, I would literally be scared for my life getting into an airline owned by, even partially by the federal government. Tal, again, we talked about unintended consequences. You know, are smart young engineers, CEOs, going to want to go work for a company where CEO pay is limited? Are they going to attract the best talent? Uh, it, it is a long-term prescription for disaster for any type of recovery, kind of re-echoing our themes here about this notion of I'm here from the government, I'm here to help, inevitably has a disastrous result when it comes to people's lives and the economy writ large. Jonathan, I have another question here for you. It says, uh, how fast... Uh, will the dollar lose its value? Is it possible the dollar will rise first because a lot of borrowing w was done in dollars? Well, again, it's, it's difficult to know because you've got like waves of stimulus crashing into all these other... Dr. Brooke has made the point, and I actually think of him, and, and uh, uh, Fleming actually alluded to a little bit, essentially saying, you know, if you're a... You know, dollar's going to decline... Ultimately, relative to what? I mean, is it, is it going to decline relative to the euro? No offense to our many European uh, viewers, but uh, would you rather hold dollars still? The U.S. is still relatively more free, much less entitlement state. Perhaps could decline relative to gold. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't have to be that apocalyptic dollar collapse uh, to make for a very difficult and very uh, weak economy. It ultimately hits you a lot more. But I'll say, I mean, if you, if you want to bet on that, if you want to invest on that, there's an ETF, which is UDN, it's Umbrella David Nancy, that goes up as the value of the dollar goes down. Again, not an investment recommendation, um, but if you think that that's what's going to happen, that's how to play it in your portfolio. Um, okay, Iran's internet is, is not uh, stabilized yet. Is it so, really uh, worth a tax break, honestly, Iran, to be in Puerto Rico when you can't get a good internet connection? No offense, Iran. Okay, well, he Jumbi, has uh, a, a, a lagoon. Fleming, uh, let, 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 let's get you in this. Um, just uh, a just few more. I wanted more. to make a comment on what Tom, Tom said. Uh, I think if we, I mean, you're talking about the United States and Israel, and I'm talking a little bit about Europe, but I think the, the global picture here is that the state is going to play an increasing role in economies around the world as a consequence of uh, what is happening now. And at the same time, the state is also limiting our civil liberties and individual uh, uh, freedoms. And, and my concern is that Tom has spoken eloquently about the rise of authoritarianism uh, uh, and populism uh, in, in other parts of the world. And my concern is that, that, that the, balling, the balance will tip uh, in favor of people who are being, you know, fooled to uh, turn security and belonging into ultimate values. I mean, life is dangerous by definition. And there, we are all, we're all running risks every time we exercise our civil liberties. But, 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 but because of the fear and because of a certain panic, um, most people believe in this, that this is a you know, life and death issue for our civilization. And, and, and I'm, I'm really concerned that we are at a historical point now where, where the balance will start to tip in, in, in favor of, uh, of state powers, not only in our authoritarian regimes, but also in, in, in uh, democracies in, in uh, North America and in, uh, in Europe. <coughs> I don't know what your take is on this, Tom. I, I have uh, one final question here, and uh, all of you can, can answer it. Um, if government mandates that businesses must close, uh, shouldn't government have to pay for the damages done to business owners and, and employees? I mean, we, we talked about it, uh, but, but if you can somehow maybe repeat, where do you stand? If it's the government closing, shouldn't government pay? Fleming, you can take it. I'm not an economist, but uh, I mean, as a matter of common sense, I, I think, of course. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. if you, the, 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 the government, we have delegated the power or the right to coercion and, and violence to the government uh, 
and in return uh, we should receive security and the freedom to exercise our fundamental uh, uh, liberties. Uh, so so I, I think government has a responsibility when they make it impossible for us to, to do our work, um, uh, they have to step in. Uh, Tom, a few last words uh, for, for, from you for today before we wrap it up. Well, I do think that what Jonathan mentioned about bankruptcy, I mean, even if it were, even if there were no restrictions, people would be flying less right now. And going bankrupt, and I own some uh, shares in airlines. I don't like it. It means I lose my equity share in effect. It goes to the bondholders, et cetera. But there's a process for that. And stepping in and bailing them out, it's really protecting current shareholders and then creating government ownership is a catastrophe. So I don't think that uh, all of the, the losses involved in this should be socialized. I do think that there may be a role for government as insurer of last resort to ensure that people who are operating on the margins, I'm thinking about people like waiters, for example, that they not end up going hungry or being booted out on the street. Uh, this would be, I think, a, a pretty bad consequence politically as well. Think about what that would mean. But I think we should draw a very clear line between that kind of insurer of last resort function and bailing out shareholders, or God forbid, acquiring government ownership. And last point, there is a march to authoritarianism right now. It's, and this is like putting gasoline on the fire as this is happening. And we should expect more collectivism, more baiting and hatred of ethnic and religious minorities around the world. And I wanna be very honest, uh, the Jews are usually number one or two on the go-to list of people to blame for everything. And I anticipate we're going to see more of this. The language about profiteering is the same language we've used in anti-Semitic pogroms in the past. And I honestly am very fearful about the future. I worry that in a hundred years, underground hunted dissident intellectuals will be talking about the golden age of lost liberty 1989 to 2020 and i want to work very hard with our partners all over the globe to make sure that does not happen this is the time for us to be more committed and stronger than ever i was hoping you you're going to shift to to a more positive uh, tone because i i did not want to close this uh, beautiful discussion on this very somber note that you uh, said before uh so guys thank you so much for this very fascinating conversation first i would like to give a huge shout out and thank the tel aviv international salon for uh helping us in promoting this session uh and also thank you dr yaron brook the host of yaron brook show podcast and chairman of the Ayn Rand institute uh fleming rose uh, who joined us from Denmark, a fellow at the Cato Institute, Jonathan Honig. Uh, he's the founder of the Capitalist Pig Hedge Fund and a contributor for Fox Business. And also you, Tom Palmer, uh, senior fellow at the Cato Institute and vice president for international programs at the Atlas Network. Uh, we will all do what we can to make sure that your somber prediction, um, Tom, of, of you know the, 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 the age of liberty uh, won't be gone uh, years from now.